My name is Chad Altman and I'm one of the software engineers here at Boson. Today we're going to be walking through Switch Lab 18, which is a per VLAN spanning tree load balancing lab. For the sake of window and screen space, I'm going to uh, drag the lab instructions outside of this window and put them on my other monitor. I did want to quickly show you the network diagram. As you can see, we have a pretty sophisticated network with PCs all the way on the left connected to basic switches, which connect to distribution switches, which connect to core switches, followed by the routers at the end. You can see each switch has redundancy between all other switches, and each router has redundancy to each of the two core switches. This gives us full redundancy within the topology, but this also adds a number of complications to spanning tree. So we'll go ahead and walk through the lab starting with some basic configurations on each of the devices. So let's start with ASW1 and then proceed through the network. ASW1 has basic configuration needing trunking on the Fast Ethernet 0, 1 through 0, 4 ports and that will represent each of these connections. 1, 2, 3, and 4. ASW2 will need the same configuration. For DSW, notice how many connections are made from DSW to the other devices. 2, 4, 6, 8, and then 10. So that will represent fast Ethernet 0, 1 through 0, 10. DSW2 also needs the exact same configuration. And now going to the core. The core has two connections to the routers. Now they won't be set up as trunking ports, but the rest of the ports out to the switches will need it. So we can see we have two, four, six connections to the other switches on the network. These connections are represented by Fast Ethernet 03 through 08. And now the core does have the same configuration. Core 2 has the same configuration as Core 1. 03 through 08. Now that we have a trunking enabled on the devices, we're going to set up the virtual trunk protocol, VTP. This will allow us to distribute all of the VLANs across the switches in the network without having to manually configure each VLAN on each switch. So going back to ASW1, we're going to set him up as a client, give it a domain and a password. and we're going to do that same configuration on each of the switches in the network. That will ensure each switch communicates with the others. The one exception will be CSW1. He will be functioning as the VTP server, so you'll notice the commands slightly change when we get to CSW1. So now we're on CSW1, he's set up as the server, so rather than VTP mode client, we enter VTP mode server. So now that we have VTP established, we'll switch over to CSW1 and create the VLANs, hoping that they are carried to all other switches in the network. So we already had VLAN 1 on this switch and we just created VLANs 2 through 6. To verify those VLANs have traversed the VTP network, we can switch over to ASW1. 
which if you remember was the furthest device on the left, and see that those VLANs have been carried over. So when we established CSW1 as the VTP server and then gave him VLANs, he propagated that VLAN information out to all of their switches that were within the same VTP domain with the same VTP password. Now that all switches have the same VLANs, we're going to work on load balancing. The scenario behind this lab is there are six switches, each carrying information from the group of PCs on the top and the bottom. Even though we have one PC here, it's actually representing a group of PCs, so it's a group of network traffic. We know that each group of PCs will be creating traffic, and rather than having all switches running with the same spanning tree information, we're going to group them and divvy up the traffic in half. So VLANs 1 through 3 will represent traffic traversing a set of switches, and VLANs 4 through 6 will represent the other half of the traffic. So how do we do these load balancing configurations? Well, spanning tree is one of the easier ways to do it. If you switch over to ASW1, when we view spanning tree configurations, we can see that this bridge is the root for all VLANs. Now remember, this is an ASW switch, which is an access layer switch. So he is the least powerful of the three different types of switches within the network. Probably not a good idea to have the access layer switch also functioning as the root bridge. Let's go ahead and look at the priorities for each of these spanning tree VLANs. You can see all priorities are 32,768, which is the default. It started with the default because we have just created these VLANs, and so there was no other configuration done to spanning tree. Now, if we wanted to set spanning tree up to use different switches as the root, we could use the spanning tree VLAN and list the VLAN number along with the priority. But what if we don't know the priority, or what if the priority could change? We may want to use a different command. The easier one to use would be actually the spanning tree VLAN root primary command. And this says, look at the priority across the network and make sure that I am lower than all other priorities. So let's make the configuration on DSW1. We want him to be the root for VLANs 1 through 3. And DSW2 will be the root for VLANs 4 through 6. After configuring, we're going to go ahead and view to see if anything's changed. You can see all VLANs now carry a priority of 24576 rather than a 32768. The next thing we want to do is set up the backups. So if DSW1 is the root primary for VLANs 1 through 3, we should make him the secondary for VLANs 4 through 6. Because he is the root for VLANs 4 through 6, he'll be the secondary for VLANs 1 through 3. And so after all this configuration is done, let's see if it's working properly. On DSW2, we expect him to be the root bridge for VLANs 4, 5, and 6. And you can see that is the case by the output of the show span root detail command. Now VLANs 1, 2, and 3, he is not the root. So let's switch over to DSW1 and see if he is functioning as the root for VLANs 1 through 3. And we can see that he is. He's the root for VLANs 1 through 3, but not so for VLANs 4 through 6. If we do a show run on one of these switches, we can see the commands that we've entered. Notice when we entered secondary, it used a priority of 28672, but pri primary used 24576. The next part of the lab asks us to look at the topology diagram and to map out which ports are forwarding and which ports are blocking. So we're going to work through each of the switches doing a show span to get an idea of which ports are forwarding and which are blocking. Let me also display the net map so we can get a better idea of how this is working. ASW1 has a connection, has two connections from ASW1 to DSW1, and the second connection is in blocking mode, so we know this port right here is blocked. ASW2 has connections 1 and 2 going to DSW2, which are both enabled, but connections 3 and 4 going to DSW1 has one of them blocking, 
So we see that one of these lines here is blocked and going to DSW2. And now as we walk through this lab, I'm going to show you the connections that are enabled and disabled. And then at the very end, I'll actually show you a, a diagram with those connections blocked so we can get a better understanding of what spanning tree is doing. DSW1, DSW1, if we remember, is the root bridge for VLANs 1 through 3. So when we look at all of the ports, we can see that they're all in forwarding mode because they are this switch is functioning as the root bridge for VLANs 1 through 3. Connecting to DSW2, we see a little bit different. Notice only one port out of all 10 is in forwarding mode, and that is port 05. So we know that every port except for one is blocked. And 05 is this line that goes from DSW2 to DSW1. Because DSW1 is the root bridge, one of the two connections has to be enabled. And we know that going down through the decision-making process of spanning tree, it ultimately came down to the port number, which this one's port 5 and this one's port 6. So that's why FA05 was selected as the root port connecting to the root bridge. Switching over to CSW1, we can see 01 and 02, which are the connections to the router, are both enabled. Ports 3 and 4, which are the connections to CSW2, are both blocked. Ports 5 and 6 are enabled. And remember what DSW2 is set up as? He has both of these ports blocking. That's why CSW1 can have both ports enabled, because they're blocked on the other side. And then 7 and 8 represent, are represented by these two lines here connected to DSW1. And since DSW1 is acting as the root bridge, one of those has to be enabled, and that would be the lowest port number, which would be FA0-7. And the final switch would be CSW2. He also has connections to router 1 and router 2 across the first two ports. The rest of the ports are forwarding with the exception of FA06. FA06 is the connection to DSW1, so 05 and 06 are these two lines. One of them is forwarding because DSW1 is the root bridge, and one of them is blocking to ensure that there is not a loop between the root bridge and CSW2. So now after walking through each of the switches, Let's go ahead and look at our lab diagram to get a better understanding of what's going on. So the X's represent the ports that are in blocking mode. And the really neat thing about spanning tree is if you were to take any path between any one of these devices, there is only one path to take and you won't encounter a loop. That's the whole purpose behind spanning tree is to ensure that the network is loop free. So I encourage you to open up this lab within the Boson NetSim and view this topology and walk through each one of the connections to see how one device gets to the other without a loop. And of course, you can't pass through an X on that interface. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed this video.